Chapter 6, The French Revolution and Napoleon, Discussion Number 5, Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte became a very popular person in France. You get to be popular by being a successful general, but you continue being popular by bringing the people what they want. One of the things is that he actually gave people the opportunity to vote. And most of his ruling decisions were brought about by plebiscite, which essentially says, everyone vote me in charge and I will continue doing great things. Now, Napoleon took complete control over France over a period of time while he was also waging war against the British and the, uh, the Austrians. So, they, he controlled prices, which again, dealing with inflation during a wartime period, making sure that everyone was with what they were earning was able to afford food, made him very popular. He completely trashed the, the codex of French laws and rewrote it so that it made sense to most people. And that was called the Napoleonic Code, considered to be one of his uh, more lasting contributions to Western civilization. He encouraged new industry. Uh, built roads and canals, uh, trying to catch up with the British in their industrialization and trying to bring that idea to France, established those public schools. He also uh, made sure that he instilled in the French economic system that, remember, they took all the land from the nobles and they took all that land from the church and they sold it to people. And those people were afraid that with the constant change of governments that the next government would say, all right, all that land's being given back to the church, or all that land's being given back to the nobles. And he said, no, you bought it, it's yours, we're not going to take it back. Uh, on top of that, he also made sure that everyone got their job based on the fact that they were capable of doing it instead of by birth. Remember, nobility was by birth, being king was by birth. And so all of these privileges were based on who you were born to. And people appreciated the idea that they were getting their job because they were good at it instead of having to worry about who their mom and dad were. On top of that, he also emphasized that feudalism was done. We're not going to do any more of this corvée, this weak work in order to keep the nobles happy. You're not going to owe it to the, to the government, even to Emperor Napoleon, which he eventually is going to name himself. This is the way it's going to be. So, Napoleon was able to take by war or by treaty complete control of Europe. The only countries that were unable that he was unable to get, first of all, he did not conquer Russia, he did not conquer Great Britain, and also Portugal and Sweden. They remained independent. Now, Napoleon wanted to get Great Britain, but the problem was is that Great Britain had the world's largest navy, and in order to get to Britain, you needed to go by boat. And so, because of that problem, Napoleon decided to institute essentially a reverse blockade. Instead of sending ships out to make sure that nothing could get in and out of Great Britain, he essentially forbade the entire European continent from trading with Great Britain. Because that's where Great Britain got most of its raw materials, a lot of its food, a lot of its business transactions was essentially between Great Britain and Europe. And now, because Napoleon controls all of Europe, he's saying, no, you're not trading with Great Britain. And in that way, instead of waiting for the ships to get on water and then blowing them out, he's just forbidding the ships from leaving the, con leaving the continent. Now, Britain returned the favor, attacking the trade that was going to France. The naval battles that were going on between the British and the French caused a lot of consternation when the United States ships were getting into the fray as they were trying to trade with both countries. They were trying to say neutrality will trade with both. Uh, that, along with the British Navy uh, pulling up to American ships and saying, oh, there's a British sailor that escaped, we're going to make him come with us, even though they really didn't have a whole bunch of proof. That all kind of started the War of 1812 between the British and the Americans. So, But what we see is that Napoleon, like many other conquerors before him and what we're going to see after him, tried to make everyone act like a French person. 
French holidays, uh, French laws, French ideas, and people began to resist the idea that why do we have to start acting like the people who just beat us up? Why can't we keep our own culture? And as people identified with this concept of nationalism, uh, they start saying that we're not going to do everything that France tells us. One of the first national groups to resist uh, Napoleon's takeover of Europe was the Spanish, who instituted the idea of guerrilla warfare. And guerrilla actually means little war, where they didn't necessarily get their armies together and all line up with their guns and try to shoot each other, but they would have small bands of people go attack, attack French supply trains uh, or get the troops, and then they just disappear into the countryside and that the French army didn't have a, an army to go beat up on. These were just little people. However, Napoleon was, again, as mentioned before, a very successful general, and considered to be one of the top military strategists of all time in history. Several times, European powers tried to smash him, and he was able to rout these military uh, attacks on his mili on his army. Uh, Napoleon originally beat uh, Austria and Prussia at the Battle of Austerlitz, and then Austria, Britain, and Russia tried to get him again at the Battle of Wagram, and they uh, Napoleon blew them out blew them off the the battlefield as well. And Napoleon essentially is like, well, I can't get Britain, let's go after Russia. And so Napoleon marches his military and goes into Russia. Now, he left in the springtime. His troops are wearing summer uniforms. Not a lot of heat because you don't want them marching in the middle of summer with heavy uniforms. Now, instead of doing pitched battle where the militaries would go out into the fields and, and they'd actually line up and do an actual battle, Russia instituted the idea of what's called scorched earth, where the French military could not live off the land that they were conquering because the French were burning all their crops. They were burning all of their buildings so that the French couldn't have shelter, that they couldn't have food. And so the French had to supply themselves from a long distance away, which really made it difficult to keep the army supplied and really slowed them down. Now, Napoleon was actually able to go all the way. He actually conquered Moscow. But the problem was is that there was no one in Moscow worth talking to. And he said, well, I've got the capital. He sat there through Christmas waiting for the, the Russians to come in and say, you've won, you win Russia. And no one showed up. And so starting in February, he started marching his army back, not really getting what he thought he was going to get. And then the Russians just started taking pot shots at them, like the guerrilla warfare of the Spanish. Whenever they got an advantage, they take out as much French as they could. And remember, those French soldiers were still wearing summer uniforms, and they were in the Russian winter. Many died from frostbite, starvation, because there was no food available to them. The French army, when they went to attack Russia, had over 600,000 men in that military force. <clears throat> when the French army returned to France, there was only 20,000 left. And so the only ones that, that Napoleon did not ever successfully conquer was Russia and Great Britain. So, the next year or so, some of the military forces of Austria, Prussia, uh, Great Britain all teamed up and they attacked Napoleon, and they were actually able to defeat him at the Battle of Nations. They then exiled him to the island of Elba, which you see there on slide 25, he is really, really close to the Italian uh, peninsula. And then the Battle of Nations victors put Louis the Seventeenth or Eighteenth in control of France and said, <clears throat> we win, it's all done. Now, supposedly, Napoleon was under guard at Elba, but being as that he could practically swim to Italy on his own, he easily escaped the island of Elba, went to France, was welcomed as a conquering hero, everyone joined his army. Well, yeah, everyone joined his army, but we have to remember 
that his 600,000 man army that all died in Russia, which meant that the only people who were left in France to be in this army were the really old guys and the really young kids who had not had the military training that Napoleon had in order to win those battles of Austerlitz and Wagram. And so he was easily defeated again by the Grand Army as raised by Great Britain and the other European powers. He was defeated at the Battle of Waterloo, and then he was exiled to St. Helena, which you see as the Red Star way in the middle of the South Atlantic. This concludes discussion number five, Napoleon Bonaparte, as part of chapter six, the French Revolution and Napoleon.